So I'd like to introduce Weasel, who's going to bitch about compliance for the next 50 minutes. So, all yours. Morning, guys. Um, thank you. I don't know why the fuck you guys are here at 10 o'clock in the morning. Did you not drink enough last night? Seriously? I mean, I wanted to sleep in late. But anyway, okay. Um, like I said, my name's Weasel. Um, that's about it. So, <laughs> all right. Um, the semi-secure state of compliance. Uh, basically, we all love compliance. It's this great, great, great thing. It's, it gives everybody jobs. It's, it's wonderful. Um, nothing could possibly be wrong with it. It's... It's it's like a it's 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 amazement in a jar uh, that doesn't open because it's fucking broken. Uh, basically, uh, compliance uh, probably started out with uh, some good concepts and some good ideas and maybe some good in, uh, intentions, but uh, the problem is is business got involved. Uh, you've got a lot of vendors out there that want to make money, and uh, when money comes in, conflicts of interest come in. Um, so shit screwed up. Uh, some benefits of compliance. Uh, those of us who have been around the security industry for a long time, uh, it's, we, we fought and fought and fought and fought for all kinds of controls that couldn't be put into place because it affected uh, people's uh, the usability of the systems. Uh, whereas, you know, we could, for ages, we had anywhere from zero to six character passwords back in the day when passwords were actually useful. Uh, we never could expand beyond that because it was just too hard to remember your daughter's birth date. Um, or whatever people used for passwords back then. Uh, so good thing about compliance is it does come along and, and set down some standards uh, in some places that we never could get put into place before. Um, and then, of course, standardization of co uh, controls comes in handy uh, where across multiple systems we can finally start standardizing on some controls that, that were uh, extremely different across systems and, and locations. Uh, and, of course, Compliance gives credentials for people who don't want to actually go to school or have experience, and they can go out and get a piece of paper, and everybody hires them and pays them lots of money, and everything gets worse. Okay, it's not a, not a benefit. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of some of the compliance standards just to make sure that uh, uh, we're kind of on the same page here. I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm not going to really talk about them in depth. I'm not a compliance expert. I'm just a guy who gets impacted by it and makes me want to hate and kill people every day. Uh, COBIT, uh, probably one of the first big compliances that uh, affected IT, uh, was put together by ISACA, which is the uh, security auditors uh, organization that's uh, international in the States and I think Europe, maybe a couple of other places. Um, those of you who have gone through and looked at the uh, security controls and uh, so forth in there, if I remember right, there's like maybe two sections in that 5,000-page document that actually uh, go cover IT controls, uh, but for those that those controls that are there, they're okay. Uh, I worked for an organization that used to write uh, uh, compliant or write actually security checking tools. And uh, when uh, COBIT 4 came out, we had to go through and map all of the controls that we had to COBIT. And man, did that suck. But you know, vendors wanted to say that they were in the compliance business, whether they were or not. And uh, so it basically detracted research for a year, just so we could say that we were a compliant business. And then we got bought, and I got fired. <laughs> um, PCI, that's probably the big, biggest one uh, right now. Uh, anyone who has to do with, deal with uh, credit card transactions, either moving or storing or copying or whatever uh, credit card data uh, gets covered under the PCI uh, uh, DSS standards. Uh, it's probably the shortest standards document of all the compliances out there. I think it's 13 pages or so. It's not very big, uh, and it's very practical. Uh, I mean, it seems like they're getting on the right path, at least for writing uh, compliancy standards uh, that can be actually be implemented, but uh, the downside is is uh, which I'll get into in a bit is it's an organization that feeds on itself. Uh, there's possible conflicts of interest there, and in that uh, the people that write uh, PCI also make money from training for PCI and from uh, the the certifications and so forth. So what looks like on the front may very well be a an initiative to secure systems, and it's all you know the great idea. Uh, bottom line is is that there really is just a business behind it trying to make money. Um, HIPAA is the health uh, the healthcare uh, compliance standard uh, that's pretty much implemented in standard state or steady state. Uh, there's not a lot of IT controls in that one either. It was a lot of verbiage over uh, healthcare information. 
uh, GLBA is, is a compliancy standard that uh, covers uh, financial data. Uh, I'm sorry, not financial. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, I guess it is financial. Okay. And then uh, SOX being the knee-jerk uh, standards that came in with uh, the Enron and WorldCom meltdown. Uh, one thing about SOX is that you can sit there and say that it was rushed, rushed through and all of the really bad controls in it that are oppressive, that the organizations are screaming that are oppressive uh, and were, were hastily put in. Uh, as we're learning, and then those of you that saw, I don't know when it came out, but uh, Lawrence Lessig's talk recently over the, uh, uh, the, the impending I-911 and uh, the soon-to-follow I-Patriot Act, uh, most of this legislation is written far ahead of time. They're just waiting for the opportunity to implement it. So SOX was, even though SOX is very uh, restrictive to a lot of organizations, uh, they're just controls that someone thought up a long time ago and just waited for the opportunity to put it in. So, so don't don't let them discredit the the stupid shit that comes out in these as um, just you know hastily put together. Somebody specifically wanted those controls. Uh, and then, of course, the ISO standards that we've all dealt with uh, as through its many generations. And then I don't know much about the ITAF. I just ran across it. I think it's just, you know, ISACA trying to get yet another um, auditing standard out there. All right, the psychological impacts of uh, compliance on the enterprise. Uh, of course, the false sense of security. Um, there's, we've got, uh, and this is kind of the vendor space that's really doing this. Uh, but they're really selling compliance as security, and, and, and that's a really bad thing. Uh, as a friend of mine said the other day, uh, security almost equals compliance, but uh, compliance does not equal security, and that's extremely true. Uh, it's, the vendor space is kind of cleaning up in this area, to some extent at least externally, um, where where they used to, used to get webinars and so forth and invites and uh, from various vendors uh, telling you, come see our little webinar, we'll show you how to pass an audit. And anybody with any amount of intelligence knows that's not how you approach uh, any kind of standardization or, or security. If you're focusing on, on passing audits, you're, you're fucked. I mean, you're, you're, just, you're, you're really just playing to uh, the management and the decision makers outside of your organization or, or outside of your small compartment of the organization. You're not doing what your job is, which is to secure systems, not to pass audits. And that's a fight that we'll have for forever. It's just something you get to fight every day. Um, then there's always the misinterpretation of the concepts of compliance. Uh, you'll have senior management that will go through and say, well, you know, again, compliance equals security. So uh, we've got one million a year that we spend on security. Why don't we just push that into compliance and we don't have to worry about it? It's the right way to go. We kill two birds with one stone. And never mind the fact that there's considerable amounts of areas that are not covered by any kind of compliance or compliancy standard that lose, that doesn't get any attention. And you're right back to some of the paradoxes that used to run into 10 years ago where you couldn't in, uh, implement security controls because of usability or whatever. Check my time. Okay. Uh, compliancy is a self-devouring devouring serpent, obviously. Uh, misinterpretations and misrepresentations creates a really shitty posture uh, for compliance. Um, there's considerable amount of conflicts of interest, specifically with auditors who get paid to uh, deliver results. Uh, you're never going to go out and hire an auditor and he's going to come in and say, you're secure, congratulations, give me my paycheck, because you're going to want something tangible in return for that. So you're going to find... Uh, that they find all kinds of uh, auditing uh, problems with your organization, whether they're there or not. It'll either be nitpicky or whatever. And then there's, there's the, the extreme worse. An auditor is not going to get shot in the foot or shoot himself in the foot by finding so many problems with your organization that you don't want to bring it back in again. Granted, the right mind, state of mind is that you want that kind of audit report, but the problem is, is management doesn't. Management, they want the executive summary, and not only the executive summary, but they want the reduced feature set. Uh, first thing they're going to ask is, okay, which one of these do we not have to implement? Well, an auditor is going to say you're going to implement all of them, uh, but the first thing that happens when you go into the uh, mediation meetings is they go, oh, okay, well, maybe this one's not so bad. You don't have to implement it. And then again, you've got yet another fucking hole in your organization. Um, and of course, there's the governance hypocrisies that I mentioned earlier, where, where you've, you've got just too many influences coming into these, these governance organizations that uh, 
that they just pull it in so many different ways that there's really no focus uh, whatsoever in it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I like to think that I was an optimist when uh, some of these compliances started coming out and that people really were focused on securing systems. But as we see, I mean, uh, those of you who made it over to Black Hat and saw the, the wonderfully and strategically placed booths that made everything move so smoothly, um, 80% of those booths had compliance in there, even vendors that have nothing to do with compliance. Uh, you know, the, the organiz the, I'm sorry, the, the industries, and, and this happens in every industry, this isn't, isn't something new, but it just seems that uh, the industry is, is constantly trying to replace people with product. Uh, it's, that's, that's where the money is. Uh, organizations are going to go out and find products that replace people, and that's all part of the CapEx, OpEx balancing uh, circus show that organizations do to look like they're being productive and, and, and effective. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's bad. Every, everybody wants, wants to be on the compliance bandwagon, whether they are or they're not. Uh, as I said, you know, my previous organization that I worked on, uh, we tried to sell multiple, multiple times to, uh, to very large uh, acquiring IT uh, uh, entities. And uh, at least one of those attempts was botched because, you know, the CEO pissed somebody off. So they went out and hired two consultants, two MBAs, who focus on, on, on improving the, the presence of these organizations to larger organizations to make them more attractive for buyouts. And we went from, like, January of 04 or 05 uh, being a security tools company to in six months we were a compliance company. Every product we had had a compliance uh, component, whether it was well implemented or not, that wasn't the question. And, and the really sad part about it was that the buying uh, company that ultimately bought us, they didn't care if the products were there either. They wanted compliance next to their name. There was a gap in that organization, and they needed to be able to be, maintain their, their lead in the market by being in the compliancy space. So they went out and bought somebody who said, hey, we're a compliancy company. And I was like, okay, well, now look, we're a compliancy company. So not fun. Um, oh, what's going on here? Hold on. It's not moving forward. There we go. Um, okay, the anti-progression trap. Uh, many times compliance has put controls into organizations that sure sounded great when the, compl when the, when the compliance uh, component was, was, was authored, but you've got situations where controls are being demanded to be put in a place where they're not needed, and they're also they're, they're one they're crippling progress, uh, two they're not really securing the systems, and um, three it's a waste of money. But you know we're secure because we put a firewall in front of a reverse proxy that had firewalling features because it required that a firewall be there. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the antivirus is dead argument. Uh, I'm not really going to get into it because I don't think that it is, but just I think people are, are getting in on that. But there's, there's just these concepts that, that come up that we need to embrace and make sure that we're at least looking at them as, uh, as possible evolutions of, of the IT industry and, uh, and of uh, just technology in general. We need to at least embrace them and really take a look at them and make sure that they're right before we immediately dismiss them as wrong. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, passwords, password technology is a dead technology. It took forever to convince people of that. We still don't have technologies developed or, or invented that truly replace it, but it's pretty safe to say that password cracking is extremely fast now, and we're st most organizations are at eight-character passwords, and what's that take? You know, half a day at most to crack an entire SAM? I mean, it's just, it's, it's stupid how, how we continue to have these controls in place because people won't listen and want to fight and not... Uh, not evolve the industry. And then, you know, of course, com compliance is not really helping that area because, you know, as we put more and more controls in place, there's less breathing room uh, for, for the innovators. Okay, the risk bandwagon. This uh, It's the best name I could come up with this. But basically, we've got a huge amount of concept going around, and I don't know if it's in the CIO magazine, I don't know if they're teaching this in Harvard Law where they're creating the MBA drones who replicate what they learn in their books or what, but risk if you can mitigate the risk, 
or I'm sorry, if you, can, if you can manage the risk for considerably less than actually paying for the mitigation cost, no one's actually looking at the potential damage cost of, of, of controls. So let's go out and uh, let's just put in a good process for handling disaster recovery, and that's great. Yes, we'll just dump it into the disaster recovery bucket, but no one ever actually looked at the potential cost of the disaster. So you've got, you know, we saved, you know, like in my example here, we saved, you know, three-quarters of a million dollars by putting, uh, or putting adequate or what someone would call an adequate risk management procedure around a particular part of the organization. But if that part of the organization were to go under, the costs could be $100 million or more, and no one's really balancing that. And it's really scary because you've got uh, leaders of organizations that are basically building uh, building these these uh, IT and IT groups within their organization that follow along with their methodologies and mentality, and it, it's going to be a really scary thing. This is probably the type of thing that's going to feed into the uh, I-911 that I mentioned earlier for, that Lawrence Lessig brought up. It's organizations are going to have so much risk management going on. There is going to be that big cat catastrophe that happens, and 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 we're all going to be screwed. Not only. Uh, from a financial standpoint, but also from a freedoms standpoint, because I guarantee the the I Patriot Act that will eventually come out is is way filthier and scarier than anything that's in the USA Patriot Act. Uh, and incidentally, those who aren't aren't aware of this uh, Lessig talk, I, I can't remember what website I saw it on. Uh, I think it might have been on Google News, but I'm not sure. Um, it was basically uh, information passed along directly from Richard Clark. So I think he's a pretty reputable source of what's coming down the pipe. Uh, compliance brings up the uh, Fingerprinting Foundation. Now we're getting into really more what I wanted to cover today. Uh, the great thing about standards for those of us who do penetration for a living or those of us who have uh, agendas that involve getting into systems we're not supposed to be in, I think that's about as political I can get on that. Um, Standards do uh, basically create a matrix for attacking an organization or systems. Uh, that's great. Now you know you know exactly what uh, length to set your scope for for uh, brute forcing passwords or for uh, cracking uh, encryption. Because odds are you're going to know exactly what encryptions are in place. Uh, you're going to know uh, password links. You're going to know data retention stuff. You're going to know exactly what data is supposed to be around in that organization and for how long. Um, that's bad. Uh, yes, we need data retention for other reasons, but uh, when everything is so heavily, um, what's the best way to say this? Uh, when everything is so heavily regulated uh, to the point, you basically, you're creating a, soft, uh, a scope for a software solution that, that, that push to hack, click to hack uh, tools because it, it, there's, there's no thinking that has to go into the back end of software that breaks uh, into systems anymore. Let me back up just a second. And, and, and configuration management, that's the other big thing, is, yeah, we, when we're configuring all of our systems exactly the same, this all goes back to uh, Dan Gear's monoculture paper that, that got him in trouble at At Stake several years ago. Uh, with config, you know, when everything's configured the same, all, the systems almost tend to be the same, um, especially when we start going into uh, VM spaces and stuff like that, that you've got so many systems and so many organizations, again, that we're feeding right into that I-911 event that's inevitably going to happen. Um, I think I've already touched on the encryption. Basically, uh, that's another thing, is encryption um, feeds, tells us exactly what the juicy, boot, juicy stuff are. When people implement uh, any kind of compliancy, they're only worried about implementing the bare minimum. Uh, you're only required to have encryption on credit card data? Well, that's all they're going to encrypt. They're not going to encrypt the rest of the traffic. So guess what? If I can't read it in the clear when I'm looking at the network, I know that that's credit card data. I mean, how stupid is that? I mean, yeah, yeah I don't have immediate access to the data, but again, uh, de you know, decryption is, is super easy these days. I mean, there's so many tools that make it so easy. People don't even have to write their own tools to break this stuff anymore. Um, so, yeah, encryption sucks. <laughs> um, okay, using compliance to, to map penetration. Uh, when, when you look at an organization, those of you who uh, penetrate systems either for a living or for leisure, uh, Look at the organization, uh, whether it be an individual or a corporation, nonprofit, government, whatever it is you're, you're working on. You can you can do a high level uh, look at what what the uh, compliance standards that meet on on that organization, and there's your map. There's you know exactly 
uh, what controls are going to be in place for that organization. Like I said with the uh, PCI stuff, if you know that they deal with credit card data, you know that they have to adhere to PCI, at least on the systems that do handle credit card data. Uh, so you don't spend a lot of time or effort um, trying to break into something or uh, break something that that you know it's not gonna, it's not going to break in those those scenarios. Uh, and then of course, uh, what was the other? Yeah, and then and then uh, what was my thought? Sorry guys, it's early, still drunk. Um, it was a late night. I mean, uh, you're with me. Thank you. Um, God damn, I can't remember. I had a good point that I was going to make on this slide, and, and for some reason my notes are gibberish, probably because I typed them when I was drunk last night. Okay, we'll move on. Um, here's an example of basically an attack, an attack. The concept, this is not something that's even remotely beneficial to anybody right now, but basically look at your attack avenues on an organization. Then overlap what standards uh, apply to that, and then you basically, you eventually start building that roadmap uh, into that organization or into that system uh, to, to circumvent and, and reduce your, your effort. The other, th the other benefit of mapping out an organization uh, ahead of time through compliancy is that uh, you reduce risk of detection as well. Uh, if, if you're sitting there uh, hammering away at, you know, uh, at a system uh, with something that's not going to get in because of a compliancy implementation, you know, you're, you're improving or increasing chances of detection. All right, to you developers out there, I've got a tool request. This would be a really, really cool thing if someone could come out and make an attack matrix tool based on compliancy standards. Uh, you basically put in uh, all of the uh, things that you know about uh, the target. Uh, it goes through and determines exactly what compliancy standards uh, apply to it and creates your attack matrix minimums and then feeds out into a common uh, format for feeding into those tools. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm kind of a big fan of the whole Metasploit uh, 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 ease of use uh, concept of, of, of attacks. It's just, it's a really, really cool thing. And it would be great if uh, somebody could do this. If somebody wants to talk, contact me um, to, to work on this or something or get, some, get my notes on this, I'll be happy to disseminate that. Or I, I may actually put, a, put all my notes. I've got quite a few notes on the, on the tool features on this. Uh, that I may put them in the slides because I'll publish these slides on the NMRC website this weekend and I'll, I'll put those notes in there. Okay, it's not quite the conclusion, uh, but it's kind of the end of this section of the talk. Uh, really, you know, go out there and, and fight. Really, really, really fight uh, the, the compliancy stuff out there. Get involved in the organizations that actually develop these. Join ISACA and, and see if you can't feed into the, the, the decision makers uh, in these groups and help them realize that, yes, we need controls in place, but let's uh, try and do theoretical controls that don't create, uh, create standards that are so, so restrictive that, they, uh, that, the, that they're creating these roadmaps for attack. Um, I'll do some real quick Q&A, and I'll move on to the next part. Did anybody have any questions? Do you ever tell an organization that actually does risk detection, that actually says, this is what breaks my website security process, this is what someone breaks into my office on Malibu because of a call? Okay, so basically the question is, uh, have I ever run into an organization that does the risk assessment and actually really looked at the actual costs of an incident versus the uh, costs of mitigation versus risk management. Is that, is that right? Um, no. Uh, I, I, well, I can't say that. I, there was one organization that I worked with that was, you know, it was one of these companies that had been around literally for 100 years and is very process driven. Uh, they've made it through all of the, you know, the, the growing pains of major organizations so they could spend a little bit more time on things like this. And it was a critical infrastructure. Uh, so there was heavy regulation during the Clinton administration. Uh, to protect critical infrastructure, so we kind of had a benefit there, uh, but I think that was a that was a diamond in the rough. But we did pretty pretty extensive uh, research on everything. We assumed what it would cost total cost of replacement of equipment. Uh, you know, not you know, basically you go and take your total cost of ownership, uh, subtract that for every system that could be impacted. Uh, it's not really that hard to do, I don't believe. Uh, I don't know who's I've, I haven't been in the disaster recovery or the uh, business continuity uh, domain for many years. 
but I can only assume that, that people have now applied all the psychological costs and all, all of the other uh, uh, ancillary costs that go along with a major disaster or a major loss. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard to do that. I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand consulting firms that had a booth at Black Hat that could probably take care of that. Um, anything else? Um, what, what are my thoughts on GLBA and SOX and, and to what specific component or? Right. Um, well, as I said, I'm not a compliance expert and uh, I was luckily when, when SOX and GLB were, GLBA were both being implemented, I didn't work for financial organizations to really have to dig deep into them. Uh, the only components that I really looked at on the, those was when we were trying to map out uh, controls at the organization that I worked at during that time. Uh, looking at the uh, technical controls, trying to map them over to the functionalities of our products. So I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because I don't know it well enough at a broad enough scope uh, to, to be able to give you a, a solid answer on that. But, you know, if you want to get into a more detailed question in the Q&A afterwards, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk to you and maybe we can, I can maybe help a little bit better there. I'm sorry that I, that's kind of a gap in my uh, compliancy experiences. Um, any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it because of the light. So, so they, uh, new technology right. Right. Is the audit valid? That's that's really the question. Obviously, the the organizations behind. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the? Let, let me. Uh, is the is the validity of an audit on a new technology that w where the uh, audit standards were not in place prior uh, to that technology, or I'm sorry, the, the, the audit requirements were in place prior to that technology being invented. So basically when someone comes out with a new technology and uh, an auditor does a, say, a, a PCI audit on it or, or a SOX audit on, on that system, uh, is the audit valid? Now are you saying is the audit valid specifically uh, the, the total audit or just the audit of that system? Right. Right. Well, I would say from a legal standpoint, it's 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 probably very valid because uh, uh, on a le from a legal angle, we tend to uh, back up the establishments and not necessarily question everything every time. Uh, is it valid from a security standpoint? It really depends on the system, of course, uh, or the technology, uh, but. Yeah, bottom line is is it's really up to the interpretation of the person being audited. That's the thing that you've got to do when you guys are getting audits in, in, in the IT field is make sure that the education goes into management as to what exactly these audits are. Uh, you know, so many times, you know, there's that fear mongering that goes on with auditing. It's like, oh, no, we're getting auditing. It's my job's on the line. Your job shouldn't be on the line for the audit. Your job should be on the line as to whether or not you actually implemented the uh, the, uh, the mitigation components for the audit, and that's 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 so often missed. Uh, you, again, that goes back to the the marketing campaigns from a lot of the vendors is you know pass your audit uh, uh, webinars and and training and and so forth. It's it's bad. You know, it it just seems like we we keep missing this point is that. You know, yeah, if you have two audits in a row and you said that something was mitigated or something was, you know, there, there, you actually implemented controls to fix an audit item and you still fail it, that's when people's jobs should be on the line. That's, that's when the audit uh, actually, one, has benefit for what it's really doing and uh, two, uh, really grades uh, the effectiveness uh, of, the, of, of the implementations. But other than that, uh, from a legal standpoint, I'm sure it's backed up. Um, if, if, a new if you question it, the really only thing you can do is go to the governance board. I haven't really uh, dealt with any of the governance boards directly uh, other than I saw, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ISC2. Um, is that how they say that? I, I guess it's ISC2. Uh, is it? ISC squared. Oh, that's even geekier. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I've dealt with them, and there really was uh, uh, deaf ears. I had issues with quite a few things. Um, another example is I know somebody that works for Juniper who was uh, – there's a new cert. It might be ISC2 as well that's doing a cert on software assurance. Is that correct? Someone's developing a software assurance, basically, uh, is prop, you know, secure coding and so forth. And he, he submitted extremely basic 
um, questions for the uh, test pool for this new cert. And some of them were basically very simple, basic uh, memory management. And the, the response he got back from that board was that the, the question was too technical. And I mean, if you're a software assurance professional, shouldn't you know very, very well what mem how important memory management is? I, I, it, it's, it, it, it baffles me. Um, that, that goes back to feed with the, the hypocrisies of the governance boards is that they really are out to make a buck. I would love to say, I would love to say no, 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 it's, that's not what's going on, but it really does give the impression that they're just trying to create yet another credential that, that, that people want to run out and get so that they can get high paying jobs without experience or education. Um, but hopefully, hopefully it's changing. I know it's not, it's, uh, but hopefully it's changing. I won't go to, I won't go into my certification rant here, but okay, I will for a second. Um, certifications are stupid. Uh, they've got some really, really good benefits uh, in that, thank you. Uh, one of the benefits of certification, which is this, is if you use certifications for anything in your organizations, this is exactly why you use a certification. And it's a common body of knowledge that you can hold your people responsible to. Anything outside of that, it's extremely stupid. It's not a drop-in replacement for 20 years experience uh, uh, anal analyzing systems. It's not a drop-in replacement for a Dartmouth PhD. Sorry, it's just not that. I mean, I'm not a big education person. Uh, I've got... I, I tend to work with a lot of educated people. Maybe that's why, because <laughs> they think on a different level. I, it's, it's crazy stuff. Um, I'm more of a practical person, so as opposed to a, a theological person, even though most of the talks I do are really theory more than anything. Um, that's just kind of sharing of a mindset. So, yeah, um, certs aren't going away. Uh, compliance is not going away. Get used to it. Uh, get involved with the uh, governance boards and see if you can really change their mind a little bit. I would love to talk to somebody from a governance board. If you're here, please come talk to me. Uh, it's, it's just crazy how it is. It's, and, and, and I know um, I recently saw a movie. I was a little late watching it uh, called uh, The Smartest Men in the Room, the Enron uh, documentary or Dramumentary, whatever you say. Uh, they were they referenced a study from the 60s over accountability, and it really comes into play here. And I think this is why uh, these governance boards get so screwed up because it's it's someone else's responsibility, it's someone else's fault. I'm just doing my job, making a paycheck. It just happens over in this crazy loop. Uh, the premise of the study was that they had uh, they had an actor, and then they had a subject in these tests. And uh, the actor was in one room, the subject was in another, and the subject would systemically go through and uh, I don't remember if he was asking questions and every time he got the question wrong, he threw a trigger and the trigger was supposedly shocking and the actor would act like he's actually being shocked and they would have this, this, the subject actually systemically go through um, each question. Every time a question was wrong, it would be a, a greater shock. And uh, they, if I remember right, they had a section of the, the panel uh, uh, as you went up the, the, the panels. I mean, this is the 60s. This is the old spaceship, big, tall, giant box with flashing lights and a bunch of switches. Uh, that's really, so it really created a great illusion that this was a massive apparatus and you're really hurting this man in the other room and he would be screaming and everything. But there was actually a section towards the end where it said, it said fatal or dangerous or, or warning, do not go past this point. And everybody would get to that point and the guy would scream extremely loud when he got close to that and people would not push past that section. Sorry. Screensaver. I'm talking too goddamn much for one slide, apparently. Um, there we go. Uh, anyway, uh, the thing was, that the, the interest, interesting thing about the study was that as soon as they would get to that area, they would stop and turn to the tester and say, I'm going to kill this guy. I can't move forward. And half of them would ask this, the, a very important question. Uh, are you, you know, talking to the tester saying, will you take responsibility for this? And when the tester would take the responsibility for the shock treatment, they would just go right at the switch because it was no longer their responsibility. It wasn't their fault if they killed the man in the other room. So that's a great human study, and I think that's really what feeds into why uh, large organizations uh, with too many people, too, too much management, too much responsibility, you have too many people, you have so many people responsible that not one person is really responsible. So they're able to really push into these crazy loops of, of obfuscate, uh, how would I say that, Obfusc obfuscuity, thank you. Sorry, it's still early. Um, 
and 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 it it just seems like it's a, it's a it's a never ending spiral but it makes money so it'll keep going so again you know get out there and really really talk to these organizations go to that you know those of you that really get pissed off by this join the little local isaka groups and and bring it up every meeting be, be a sort you know be be a, a thorn in their side in these meetings and say hey guys you know again compliance is stupid why are we doing it so okay uh any other questions yes Um, I, I don't know anything about the federal standards. That's probably the main reason I left them out. The question was why I left out the federal standards. Uh, I, I haven't been involved with them enough uh, to really be able to talk on it. I wasn't specifically trying to do a, a broad scope uh, list of uh, compliance standards. I was just trying to use them as examples, and those are the ones that I've had somewhat at some amount of experience with. So that's the only reason that I didn't cover the federal standards. I can only assume that they're worse and <laughs> they're more obfuscated than anything else. Just like uh, you know, it's the military. What do you expect? Um, okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's take a quick break and have some fun. Um, so some observations that I had at Black Hat. The first one is room security illusion. We've all got these great safes in, uh, in, um, in our rooms at Caesars. Uh, I, mine malfunctioned. It wasn't the fact that I was drunk and punched the wrong number in when I locked it. Um, I promise. Uh, I called them up. They showed up. Uh, underneath the handle is an RJ11 connector. Plug the fob in, open the door. That's not secure. I'm sorry. So if it's, if it's on a fob, it's on eBay. If it's on eBay, anybody who gets into your room has one, right? Anybody that's going to do that. It happens. Uh, I really don't think that there's really any kind of illusion of security. The other great thing, and it kind of goes into this next point that I have, was um, what booth had that stupid spin the wheel thing that was so annoying? Who was that? Does anybody remember? Was that like Core Impact or next to Core Impact? or? For Oh, it was Fortify. Is anybody from Fortify here? You want to come up, please? Um, yeah, that was stupid. Uh, you have, you, you, I mean, you have this, this tart up there with a big feather, whatever that was, spinning. The only person having any fun at this thing is the guy that went in and turned in to get his free spin on the wheel. That's the only person having fun. But... We decided to give this woman a microphone and tell everyone else how much fun he's having while he's doing it. And while we're standing there in line because we left to talk, you know, because we thought that break meant we could go get a drink and not go stand in this crazy fucking clusterfuck of a gauntlet in this very tiny hallway. Um, I mean, I wasn't there last year. Was it the same way? And didn't someone say last year that they were fixing that? Is there too many MBAs at the new company that owns it that they can't make, come to a decision? I mean, yeah, 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 obfuscuity at its best. I did bring up the company's name. God damn me. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just, I'm starting to hear a Bill Hicks uh, bit here now. Fuck you, I'm not talking about that. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, that was stupid. A thing that went along with that is... They were going around, I guess apparently everyone that was flagged as a black hat attendant at Caesars got a little wheel or something in there, or an invite down to the booth. Is this the same thing? Um, I was walking back to my room, and there's a, there's a, uh, a hotel uh, individual walking through, uh, opening doors, putting this little flyer in people's rooms and closing the door. I'm sorry, I rented that room. The only reason you're coming into my fucking room is to clean it and to change out the dead hooker. Every, every time else, stay the fuck out. I mean, what kind, of, uh, what kind of security vendor is this? You're talking about a vendor that's supposed to be focused on fucking security, and they're putting flyers in people's rooms. Yeah, yeah, it's trust. Yeah, whatever. Okay, one other point. Booth babes. Wow, there was a lot of them, huh? Um, I actually made this statement. Um, about two weeks before Black Hat, I said, as soon as my trade industry starts having booth babes, I need to get the fuck out uh, because it's over. Um, I think that pretty much the concept is if you – those of you who are just starting in IT uh, or starting in more specifically in security, and like maybe this is your first or second trip, uh, leave, seriously. Um, there's, no, there's no chance of breaking in. Once there's booth babes at your trade – at your trade uh, show, you're screwed. You're not, you're not getting into that industry. That means there's too many fucking people in there. Um, but 
there is there's a caveat. A couple of them look like tore up hookers, so maybe there's still chance. Uh, I mean, really, really, twenty dollars an hour, guys? Can you spend a little bit more? Uh, so, so maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's one more year to break in. Maybe next year we'll have some uh, some some uh, E3 quality uh, uh, booth babes, and and those, those old cynics can uh, can have more stuff to bitch about. Um, that's the great thing about being in an industry a long time. You can be extremely bitter about it. And, you know, so you new guys, come on over. The water's warm. We, we'll welcome you in. So, okay. Uh, I'm actually running a little short, but I do have uh, time for more questions if anybody has any. Okay. Well, you guys have a good – oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So so NIST went out and did a – did they do a, just a sampling or did they do a broad test of all tools? It was a broad test of all tools. They went out and tested all the security tools to see that they actually did what they say that they're doing. So definitely go out there and check your tools before you go shopping for tools. Um, they should be able to tell you. Uh, at least give you an idea of, of, of the quality of the tool. And uh, all right, well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you coming, and uh, have a good con.